Today's message is uh, a simple message uh, entitled, Fight of My Life, and I want to take this text, Goliath has fallen. Tell the person beside you, Goliath has fallen. Ushers, if there's anybody on the outside waiting to get on the inside, you can let them in. Tell them again, Goliath has fallen. Did you hear what I just said? I didn't say he's getting ready to fall. I said he's already fallen. Somebody shout it again. Goliath has fallen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Goliath has fallen. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, it is quite interesting to note that in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, David is anointed as king. But in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, David is appointed as king. That it really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, God chooses David. But it's not until 2 Samuel chapter number 5 that God uses David for the task that he chooses him for. What amazes me is not that David is anointed but not get appointed as king, but what amazes me is that somewhere between the time of God choosing David and the time of God using David, in 1 Samuel chapter number 17, David is in the fight of his life. That really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that God chose David in 1 Samuel chapter number 16 for the specific purpose of being the second king of Israel in spite of his occupation and in spite of his generation. It is absolutely amazing that God has rejected the first king of Israel whose name is Saul because of his disobedience. God says to Saul that I want you to destroy all of the Amalekites. I want you to destroy all of the people who happen to be my enemies. Saul says back to God, I'll destroy some of them, but I'll keep the good parts in order to make a sacrifice. God checks on whether or not Saul is obedient to him. And would you not believe, ladies and gentlemen, that God says to Saul that you are not obedient even in your partial obedience. Because partial obedience is disobedience all at the same time. Whenever God tells you to do something and you only do part of what God tells you to do and you don't do all of what God tells you to do, partial obedience is the same thing as disobedience. And because of the disobedience of Saul, God rejects him as king. And so therefore, as a consequence, in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, God sends Samuel the prophet to the house of Jesse for the specific purpose of finding the second king of Israel. And when Samuel gets to Jesse's house, he goes through all of Jesse's sons that happen to be located inside of the house. And on the outside, the sons of Jesse appear as if they could be the next king of Israel. But every time that Samuel tries to anoint the sons of Jesse, God says to Samuel that the one you think is the one is really not the one. Samuel says back to Jesse, and I quote, you've got to have another son. And Jesse says, I have another son, but here's the key word. He says, but. Everybody shout, but. He says, I've got another son, but you don't want to use him as the second king of Israel. Number one, because of his generation. He is too young to be king. Number two, because of his occupation. The only reason he's not inside of the house, he's out inside of the field tending to the sheep. He has a lowly and a menial job as a sheep keeper. And so therefore, as a consequence, it's the father of David who rejects him and says he's unfit to be the next king because of his occupation and his generation. And God says to Samuel, the same one that the father rejected is the same one that I want you to anoint as the next king of Israel because man looks after out of appearance but God is looking after heart. Aren't you glad this morning that God can use whoever he wants to, whenever he wants to, however he wants to and he needs nobody's permission in order to do so. Aren't you glad this morning that folk on the outside are sizing you up and they are judging you as if you were unable to be used by God, but in spite of what people say, in spite of your generation, and in spite of your occupation, God is able to use you this morning. What amazes me is that in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, David is anointed as king. 
In 1 Samuel chapter number 16, God chooses David, but it's not until 2 Samuel chapter number 5 that God uses David and appoints him as king that he's anointed him for in the previous stages of his life. But somewhere between the choosing of David and the using of David, in 1 Samuel chapter number 17, David finds himself in the fight of his life. Can I pause for the specific purpose of speaking to all of us in here under the sound of my voice when God chooses you for a task somewhere between the time of God's choosing and the time of God's using you will experience the fight of your life I got a slow class, I need an AP class. I'm going to say that again. When God chooses you for a task, somewhere between the time of God's choosing and the time of God's using, you will experience the fight of your life. You don't look like it on the outside, but somebody came to church screaming, Pastor, I'm in the fight of my life. You look good on the outside, but in spite of how you look on the outside, somebody can attest to the reality I'm fighting on the inside. Your fight is not my fight, and my fight is not your fight. But everybody in here knows what it is to have to fight inside of your life. Maybe the fight's inside of your home. Maybe the fight's on the job. Maybe the fight's inside of your marriage. In spite of how it is that you look on the outside, all of us know what it is to be in a worship, but yet I'm still in the fight of my life. Does anybody know what it is to have uplifted hands but I'm still in the fight of my life? Does anybody know what it is to be praising God but I'm still in the fight of my life? Does anybody know what it is to be in church but I'm still in the fight? Somebody shout I'm in the fight of my life. And many of you are discouraged this morning. You're discouraged because you think that your fight has come to kill you. You don't even realize that the very fight you're trying to get rid of, God is saying it serves as confirmation that I chose you. The very fight that you're trying to get rid of, it serves as confirmation not only that I chose you, but I'm getting ready to use you getting ready to use you in spite of what man said about you. I've chosen you in spite of what your friend said about you. I'm getting ready to choose you and use you in spite of your generation. I'm getting ready to choose you and use you in spite of your occupation. Aren't you glad this morning that God does not need nobody's permission in order to do a work inside of your life? God does not report to a board. I'm speaking to everybody in here who's in the fight of your life somewhere between the time of God's choosing and the time of God's using, you will experience the fight of your life. What amazes me is not that David is in the fight of his life, but what amazes me is the confirmation of his fight. It is quite interesting to note that David is in the fight of his life, number one, because the scripture says, according to 1 Samuel chapter number 17, around verse number four, that he's fighting a Philistine giant by the name of Goliath, who's over nine feet tall. You know that you are in the fight of your life when the problem that you are fighting is bigger than you. Not only is he fighting a Philistine giant who's over nine feet tall, number two, ladies and gentlemen, he's in the fight of his life because all of Israel, who happens to be God's chosen people, are terrified of the giant that David is getting ready to fight. This Philistine giant is standing on the other side of the mountain and he's taunting the children of Israel, who happen to be God's chosen people, for 40 days and 40 nights and nobody has enough courage in order to step up to fight this Philistine giant and here comes this little bitty boy by the name of David he comes down there in order to take his brother's lunch but while he's taking his brother's lunch he noticed that all of these people are scared of this Philistine giant he noticed that all of the children of God are not operating in faith but whether they are operating in fear and David says that God has not given me the spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind and so therefore as a consequence when everybody else is terrified David has courage I need somebody to shout courage if you're going to win the fight of your life you got to have some courage courage is not the absence of fear it's obedience to God in the presence of fear He's in the fight of his life because his problem is bigger than him. He's in the fight of his life because everybody surrounding him is terrified of what he's fighting. Number three, he's in the fight of his life. Hear this clearly because his fight is more experienced than him. 
How do I know that his fight is more experienced than him? When David gets ready to fight this Philistine giant by the name of Goliath, everybody says, hold up, David. If I were you, I wouldn't do that. Saul says to David, David, do you even know what it is that you're getting ready to do? Have you not considered that you're nothing but a youth? And Goliath has been a warrior since the days of his youth. The question has to be raised, how do I know that I'm in the fight of my life? I know that I'm in the fight of my life, number one, when what I'm fighting is bigger than I am. If you could defeat it by yourself, that's not the fight of your life. But I'm speaking to somebody in here under the sound of my voice who can attest to the reality. I've been in some fights inside of my life, but what I'm dealing with, I ain't never had to deal with inside of my life. I've, I've been in some fights inside of my life, but I ain't never been in a fight quite like the one that I'm dealing with at this particular moment in time. I'm in the fight of my life pertaining to my marriage, the fight of my life on the job, the fight of my life in my finances the fight of my life. I'm dealing with a health condition that the doctors don't even know how to treat. Does anybody know what it is to be in the fight of your life? But I came to encourage somebody. Your fight might be bigger than you, but it's not bigger than the God that you serve. He, he's in the fight. He's in the fight of his life. Because what he's fighting is bigger than him. You know that you're in the fight of your life when your fight is bigger than you and you can't defeat it by yourself. You're in the fight of your life when what you are fighting caused those around you to be afraid of what you are fighting. When other people on the outside are looking inside into the intricate parts of your situation and they won't say it to you because they don't want to discourage you but they're mumbling under their breath and they're saying, I'm glad that it's you and not me. I don't know what I would do if I had to walk a mile in your shoes. Isn't it amazing that you are surviving what other people would die in? Isn't it amazing that other people size you up and they judge you on the outside and they think that living your life is easy, but you are sitting next to somebody this morning. You don't know what it took for them to get out of the bed. They in the fight of their life. You're, you're sitting next to somebody this morning. You don't know what it took just for them to get themselves dressed and fully clothed. They're in the fight of their life. You're sitting next to somebody this morning and you can't tell because of how it is they look on the outside. You don't know what it took for them to walk into the house of worship they're in the fight of their life and you sitting here looking at them crazy when they praise and worship talking about it don't take all of that maybe it don't take all of that for you but you don't know the kind of hell somebody had to crawl out of just to get to church this morning I'm in the fight of my life because what I'm dealing with terrifies others I'm in the fight of my life because what I'm dealing with has more experience then I have somebody's fighting divorce. You ain't the first. Divorce has been around long before you ever came to earth. It has more experience than you. Somebody's fighting a sickness. You ain't the first. Sickness has been around long before you ever came to being on earth. It has more experience than you. Somebody's fighting a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter that you want God to bring back home. You ain't the first and you won't be the last. It has more experience than you. Does anybody know what it is to fight a fight that has way more experience than you. I'm talking to only the people in here. You are in a fight and it's way over your head. But even though it's over your head, guess who else is over your head? He sits high and he looks low. And he's able to fight all of your battles on your behalf. Does anybody believe that my problem might be above me, but it's not above the name of Jesus? For at the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, every knee has got to bow. Every tongue has got to confess of things in heaven and things on earth to the glory of God that Jesus the Christ is Lord. The Bible declares that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Watch this. Your fight has to bow to the name of Jesus. He's in the fight of his life. But I believe that inside of this text, there's some pragmatic principles that David gives to us as to how to overcome and how to conquer whenever you find yourself fighting the fight of your life. Whenever you find yourself fighting something that has more experience, fighting something that terrifies those around you and quite frankly it terrifies you. Whenever you find yourself fighting something that's bigger than you, there are a few things that we can take note of in order to win in the fight 
of our life. What amazes me before I get to this first point of what you need to do to win in the fight of your life, the only reason that David has this much confidence as short as he is when he's fighting a Philistine giant over nine feet tall, David says, I can fight him because this ain't my first fight. How you going to win, David? Why you so confident? He says, before I stepped up to Goliath, he says, I fought a lion and I killed him. He said, I didn't just fight a lion and kill him, but God delivered me from the paw of the bear. I, I was in a bear fight, and because I was in a bear fight, don't help the bear. Watch this. Don't help me. You better help the bear. He says, I took the bear out. And he says, the same God that delivered me from the mouth of the lion. And the same God that delivered me from the paw of the bear is the same God that's getting ready to deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine giant. This ain't your first fight. The same God that delivered you in 2016 and 2015 and 2014. Can anybody attest to the reality? I look good, but this ain't my first fight. I got the scars to prove it. And the same God that brought me through back then is the same God that's able to do it right now. Says, but this is what it's going to take. Number one, if you're going to win the fight of your life, we win the fight of our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus. Tell the person beside you, you got to fight with the right name. God Almighty, I wish you would say it to the whole east side here. As you tell them again, you got to fight with the right name. If you're going to win the fight of your life, you cannot win it unless you go forth in the name of the Lord Jesus. We just got finished singing the song. Does anybody know that there's something about the name Jesus? Does anybody know that something happens when you call on the name of Jesus? I dare you to just take 30 seconds and speak your name into the atmosphere. Whatever your name is, I just need you to say it aloud. Whatever your name is, I just need you to say it aloud. I know it's strange. I know it looks crazy. But whatever your name is, I, I just need you to say it aloud. Now, after you said your name, nothing happened. Now I need you to start calling on the name of Jesus. Does anybody know that when I call on the name of Jesus, don't you call that name unless you need something to take place. Don't you call that name unless you need demons to tremble. Don't you call that name unless you need sickness to bow to the name of Jesus. There is a name that I love to hear. I love to sing his words. Sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. David says if you're going to win, you got to go forth in the right name. Can I pause to tell somebody, whenever you go to a boxing match, the only reason that challengers do not beat the champion more often is not because they don't train as hard as the champion. They don't meet the champion more often because once this, the moment they start thinking about the track record of the champion and the moment they start thinking about the last name of the champion, they lose the fight, not when they step in the ring. But they lose the fight the moment they start thinking about the champion's name. Somebody just missed it. Can I pause to tell somebody that when you fight in the name of Jesus, Satan loses the fight not when the fight is over. He loses the fight the moment you start to call on his name. Because demons tremble at the name of Jesus. I ain't been a preacher my whole life. When I was young, I used to get into a fight every now and again. I know I don't look like it, but I floated like a butterfly, stung like a bee. When I was young, I used to get into fights every now and again. But sometimes when folk picked on me who were bigger than me, I would tell my best friend who was bigger than me. And when I told my best friend who was bigger than me, he stepped in and he started to fight my battles. And the antagonist who was fighting against me realized that in order to get to me, he had to go through my best friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Does anybody believe that when you call on the name of Jesus, that God knows how to step in and show out and do exceeding abundantly above all I ask and all that I think according to the power that works inside of me? Somebody shout Jesus. David says in 1 Samuel 17, verse number 45, he says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He says, the reason I'm going to win this fight is not because of my education. I'm going to win this fight because of whose name I'm fighting in. 
The reason I'm going to win this fight is not because of my downtown connections. I'm going to win this fight because of whose name I'm fighting in. The reason I'm going to win this fight is not because of how I dress. It's not because of how I drive. It's not because of where I live. I'm going to win this fight because of whose name I'm fighting in. Somebody shout Jesus. David says, second thing that you got to do whenever you find yourself in the fight of your life, we win the fight of our lives, not just when we fight in the name of the Lord Jesus. We win the fight of our lives when we give God glory. Somebody shout, give him glory. Yeah, you didn't understand what took place just a few minutes ago. You didn't even realize that that's the way that we fight. We give God glory. He says, you got to win this fight by giving glory. God the glory. Somebody shout, give God glory. David says, the only reason I'm getting ready to win this fight, he makes it clear. It's for one reason and one reason alone. He says that the world may know that there is a God in Israel. In other words, God's going to give me the victory, not because of me. He's going to give me the victory because there are people around me connected to me who don't know the God that I serve and they have to see me gain victory in this fight because when they see me gain victory, when everything else says that I should lose my fight, it's going to cause unbelievers to bow down to the name of Jesus that the world may know that there's a God in Eastlake. That the world may know that there's a God in Brown Springs. That, that the world might know that there's a God in Gate City. That the world might know that there's a God in High Chaparral. That the world might know that there's a God in Huffman. That the world might know that there's a God in Center Point. That the world might know there's a God on the east side. He says that the world might know there's a God in Israel. That's what it means to give God glory. God says, I'm going to give you the victory because when I give you the victory and people ask how you do that, you're going to open your mouth and the only testimony you're going to give them is God did it. I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't take credit for it. God did it. I don't even know how I'm as blessed as I am. God did it. I don't even deserve to be living the way I'm living. God did it. I don't deserve his favor on my life. God did it. God says, I, I sometimes have to allow you to go through the fight of your life so that folk on the outside who are connected to you can see you go through a public fight, see me deliver you publicly, and your public deliverance causes other people to bow down to my name. God says, watch this, I'm showing myself through your deliverance. The world who doesn't know me doesn't know that I'm a healer, but you do. So what I'm going to do is let you get sick, and I'm going to deliver you publicly that those connected to you will know I'm a healer. The world doesn't know I'm a provider, but you do. So what I'm going to do is allow you to go through a hard month, where you got more bills than money at the end and you can't make ends meet. I'm going to allow you to go through a phase of unemployment, but I won't let you miss a meal so that the world can know that God is a provider. The world doesn't know that God is a battle axe in a time of trouble, but you do. So what I'm getting ready to do is allow you to go through a public battle that the world might see that I'm going to fight on your behalf, that they can know I fight all your battles all at the same time. Does anybody know that God's able to deliver? Does anybody know that God's able to heal? Does anybody know that God's able to set free? I think it'll take 30 seconds and give God glory. <laughs> Giving God glory. It requires me to open my mouth. I know you want to clap your hands, but sometimes you got to open your mouth. God is asking this question to the body of Christ. Why should I deliver you if you're not going to open your mouth and tell somebody who did it when I deliver you? And you have the mentality, God, I'll open my mouth and start speaking after you deliver me. But the old people said it like this. Don't wait till the battle is over. You got to open your mouth right now. God is saying, if you can show me, you can open your mouth in trouble. I got the faith to believe that you'll keep opening your mouth when I get you out of trouble. 
Is there anybody in here who can open your mouth? Is there anybody in here who can give the devil a nervous breakdown? Somebody open your mouth. Say, it's the only reason I'm going to do it. If the world might know there's a God in Israel, number three, we win the fight of our lives when we allow God to fight our battles. Somebody shout, God, open. Somebody shout, God fights my battles. Somebody say it again, God fights my battles. You don't have to contain yourself. It ought to be sporadic breakouts of praise and worship inside of the building. Who says that church has to be in a certain form, in a certain fashion? But when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and, and I don't know when I'm getting ready to think about it, but, but the preacher might be preaching, and I might just break out in a hallelujah. The choir might be singing, and I might just break out when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and oh, he's done for me. My soul cries out, yes. Number three, if you're going to win, you got to let God fight your battles. Somebody shout, God fights my battles. Notice what David said, 1 Samuel 17, verse number 47. He says, this battle don't even belong to me. It's the Lord's. The only person who has business fighting the battle is the one whose battle it belongs to. He says, this ain't even my fight. He says, it's the Lord's fight. And he speaks to Goliath and says, he will give you into my hands. God's going to give you the victory. And you don't even have to fight. All you got to do is hold your peace. <laughs> and let the Lord fight your battles. All you got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Your biggest fight is fighting yourself not to fight because oftentimes you want to touch it, but the more you get involved in it, the more you mess it up. And God is saying, if you can just be still and know that I'm God. He says, I'm getting ready to fight on your behalf. And when God fights on your behalf, you ain't going to never have this fight again because God knows how to take out your enemies. When God fights on your behalf, you ain't going to never have to worry about this again, whatever your fight is, because God has never lost a fight, and he's always victorious. Somebody shout, the Lord fights my battles. Somebody say it again, the Lord fights my battles. I need you to say it like you really believe it with all of your heart. Somebody shout, the Lord fights my battles. God is saying this is the equivalent of you going to the boxing ring and you training for the fight. But the moment you step into the ring, God steps in and says, get out the way. I got this. He says, you tired of fighting? I got this. You tired of crying? God says, I got this. You tired of the pain? God says, I got this. If you can just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, he says, I'm the God who never sleeps nor slumbers. He fights all of my battles at the same time. He says, this battle ain't mine. This battle, this battle belongs to the Lord. And notice what happens. Saul tries to give David his armor as a kind gesture. And when he tried to give him his armor, uh, David said, thanks, but no thanks. Your armor doesn't fit me. Just because it worked for somebody else don't mean it's going to work for you. You got to be so in tune with God in this battle that you can hear what God is saying to you. He says, thanks, but no thanks. Your armor doesn't fit me. I really don't need the armor. He looks at the armor. He says, I saw you've given me a spear, but Goliath has one too. Uh, you've given me a helmet, but Goliath has one too. You've given me a sword, but Goliath has one too. I don't need a spear, a sword, a helmet, and a shield. Give me a slingshot. Why is that, David? Because David understands you can never defeat the enemy using the enemy's weapons. So now people are looking at David like he's crazy. How you gonna defeat this Philist How you gonna defeat this Philistine giant? And David is saying, "You think I don't have weapons? It's not that I don't have weapons. I don't have natural weapons. 
for the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every vain imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus the Christ. He says, I don't need this fight. All I need is a slingshot. David takes five smooth stones takes one of the stones, puts it on the slingshot, brings it back, lets it go, hits the giant in the middle of his forehead, knocks the giant clean out, kills the giant with a smooth stone. He has five, but he only uses one. You're going to get it in just a minute. He has five, but he only uses one. Even when it looks like you don't have much, you have more than what you need to win the battle that you are fighting right now. He hits the giant in the middle of the forehead. You would think that the giant will fall backwards. If you read this story, he doesn't fall backwards. He fell face first to the ground. It really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding whenever you fall face first on the ground like we were just doing, it's a prostrate position of worship. Which says that when God fights your battles, he'll cause your enemies to worship him. When God fights your battles, the same people who talk all that trash and the same people who talk all that noise are the same people who are getting ready to be laid prostrate and say that there's nobody like your God. God knows how to make your enemies bow down to him. Does anybody believe that God will cause even your enemies to worship the God that you serve? Here's the last thing. He didn't just hit him with a slingshot. But the scripture declares that when he hits him, he says, I'm going to smite you. That means I'm going to kill you. After he does that, he says, I'm going to take your sword and chop your head off. That means I'm going to destroy you. Then he says, I'm going to take all of your weapons and bring them back to my people. That means I'm going to steal from you. Okay, I got a slow class. I need an AP class. David says to his giant, I'm going to smite you. That means I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to take your weapons. I'm going to bring them back to my camp. I'm going to steal from you. Uh, John chapter 10 verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to do three things. To steal, to kill, and destroy. Uh, that's the mission statement of Satan. So what God is saying is when you hold your peace and let me fight your battle. The same thing that Satan tried to do to you is the same thing that I turn around and I cause to happen right back to Satan. And the only reason he does it, he says that the world may know that there's a God in Israel. He says, I want the world to know your God, but they'll never know your God if they never see your fight. So the question has to be raised, what are some practical things that we can use in order to win the fight of our life? Number one, you got to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. I wish I had something deep to give you. I wish I had some super uh, spiritual and spooky to give you. That's, that's all I got. When, when you fight in the name of the Lord Jesus, preacher, that sound good. What does that mean? Pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. You don't fight like everybody else fights. You fight through prayer. What is your prayer life like outside the church? Outside of Sunday morning worship, outside of Wednesday, you got to pray. And when you pray, don't close your prayer out by saying, in your name. I don't know whose name that is. You got to close it out by saying, in the name of Jesus. Because when you say your name, nothing happens. But when you call the name of Jesus, something has to take place. When you call the name of Jesus, something has to happen. You fight it on your knees in prayer and you pray in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Number two, you got to witness about the name of Jesus. Somebody shout witness about the name of Jesus. 
What does it mean to bring God glory? It means to be his witness. It means to be his mouthpiece. You got to speak the name of Jesus. The only reason he wants to deliver you is that when he delivers you, that you can let the world know that he did it. You got to open up your mouth and speak the name of Jesus. You might not know all the Bible. You might not know all the scripture, but you can share your testimony. There's no testimony without a test. So he lets you go through the test in order to give you a testimony. And the Bible declares in Revelation 12, verse number 11, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the lamb has already been shed. The only thing left to do is to share our testimony. But the reason you don't want to share your testimony, you don't want to be transparent. Because I don't want you to know what I'm going through. You don't want me to know what you're going through. We want to act like we got it all together, like we crossed every T, like we dotted every I. So we stand up and we test a lie instead of testify. And we say, I want to thank the Lord for being saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. And y'all just pray for me and my strength in the Lord. That ain't your real testimony. Your real testimony is what you did before you were saved and how you got saved. Your real testimony is where you've been and how far God brought you. Your real testimony is that I used to drink, used to smoke. I used to be a fornicator, but God has delivered me. If you want to get more real than this, tell everybody, I still got a problem, but don't count me out just yet because God is still working on me. God says when you become transparent and speak his name and share your story with other people, it's your victory that gives somebody else the strength to keep going. Last but not least, don't just pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't just witness about the name of Jesus. Here's the third practical thing. Be at peace. And you can only be at peace when you trust God is fighting on your behalf. See, see, you waiting until this fight is over to have peace. God is saying, you don't have to wait till it's over. I want to give you peace while you're still in it. And the only way you can be at peace is when you know that God is fighting on your behalf. Don't allow this fight to break you down and cause you to have anxiety attacks. Worried about stuff that you have no control over. God says, give it to me. Cast all of your cares upon me because I care for you. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep in God your heart and your mind through his son Christ Jesus. He says, Philippians 4, verse number 8, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report when there's virtue and praise, he says, think on these things. How do you get peace? You get peace not when you come out. You get peace when you were still in it. He says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, I'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Jesus. I only came to talk to those who are in the fight of your life. Wherever your fight is, you don't look like it on the outside, but I'm fighting. I don't look like it on the outside, but I'm struggling. And I want you to know that God has already given you victory. I want you to know that Goliath has already fallen. Whatever your giant is that you're fighting that's bigger than you, that has more experience than you, that terrifies you and everybody around you, God's fighting on your behalf. Everybody stand to your feet.